I am going to Hyderabad now, 1032 Muffakam Ja College, Hyderabad. Over to you. I have two questions. So, you need to answer both the questions graphically as well as experimentally. Sir, my first question is uh, for an ideal gas. Do H by do P at constant temperature into dP is equal to 0. And my second question is, what is the difference between partial differential equation and uh, exact differential equations? You need to answer both the questions graphically as well as experimentally. I do not understand what do you mean by graphically as well as experimentally. I can't do an experiment here and uh, explain it. What is the first question pertaining to ideal gas? So, first question is dou H by dou P at constant temperature into dT is equal to 0 for an ideal gas. No, but how can something into dT be equal to 0 and partial of what with respect to partial of change in enthalpy with respect to change in pressure at a constant temperature into yes. dP is equal to 0 one equation you have drawn it sir already. For an ideal gas, you want to show that um, partial of enthalpy with respect to pressure at constant temperature is 0. Okay, that can be derived. In fact, we can derive an expression for partial of enthalpy with respect to pressure at constant temperature. I am not sure whether that is, that is a, a derivation here, but that is one of those standard uh, relations which we have. And then substitute the PVT relationship of an ideal gas in that, and you will be able to show that it is zero. What is the problem? Sir, how about second question, sir? Partial differential equation oh. and exact differential equation. Okay, uh, this is actually a mathematics problem, but as I understand it, a partial differential equation turns up when you have the uh, function to be solved for is a function of two variables. For example. Uh, in heat transfer say conduction. Uh, in a two dimensional situation, the temperature could be a function of location in the x direction as well as location in the y direction. So, temperature first is a function of x and y and the differential equation contains the derivatives of t with respect to x as well as the derivative of t with respect to y. If the uh, order of uh, differentiation is more than 1, they may even include partial derivatives. For example, our conduction equation says that if the conductivity is uniform and if you have a steady state, then the uh, uh, temperature is governed by the differential equation second partial derivative of T with respect to x plus second partial derivative of T with respect to y is 0. Such an equation where uh, the, the solution is expected to be a function of more than one variable, and the in the differential equation derivatives with respect to more than one independent variables occur is known as a partial differential equation. Now, an exact differential equation is a term used for an ordinary differential equation. So, suppose you have a differential equation which finally can be written down as say if it is a first order ordinary differential equation. Suppose it is to be solved for y equal to uh, as y as a function of x, then if you can write it down as simply d by dx of some function of some non differential function of y and x to be equal to 0, then it turns out to be a an exact differential equation. If you want a mathematically neat and proper and complete definition, you will have to look up a book on calculus. I think you will have uh, something about this in either Thomas and Finney or Krasik. These are the two standard books in engineering mathematics which we use here. And these are the two very popular books on engineering. Solapur. 1131 Valchand Institute of Technology. Over to you. How to solve problem number 5? In which part? SL.5. SL.5. SL, second law. Okay. 
that is about the insulated cylinder, insulated chamber of volume 2 V naught. We have an insulated chamber, thin separating partition, separating it into two parts one volume V naught, another volume V naught. One chamber contains an ideal gas at a pressure P naught and temperature T naught. The other chamber is evacuated, nothing, vacuum it is uh, insulated. So, the whole thing is adiabatic. The partition is suddenly removed, show that when equilibrium is re established, the temperature is T naught. Determine the change in entropy, which irreversible process has taken place. Let us select our system as the gas in the non evacuated partition. Let that be our system. The process is the partition is removed and the gas expands into the free space. The final volume of the gas will be 2 V 0. So, let us see what we can sketch on the process diagram. Initially pressure is P naught, volume is V naught, this is the initial state, let me call it state 1. Final state, I only know at the at this time that the final volume will be 2 V naught. So, state 1 is V naught, P naught, T naught. Final state 2, let me call it 2 V naught, sum P 2, sum T 2. Okay. Now, with the reading we cannot do anything more than this. Now, let us start thinking. We have to apply first law. Since it is given to be insulated, at least one term in the first law is known to us q equals delta E plus w which is first law and q equals 0 because it is insulated. Now, let us see what is about w. There is no mention of a stirrer, there is no mention of an electric connection. So, W if at all will be the expansion work, but is the gas expanding? The gas is expanding freely. Is there another surrounding system or is there a piston against which it is doing work? No, it is a free expansion. So, the gas cannot do any work, although its volume increases from V naught to 2 V naught. And that means W equals W expansion plus W other. W other is 0 because there is no hint otherwise. And W expansion also is 0 since it is free expansion. Remember that for work to be done, there must be a donor system and a recipient system. Here there is no other system involved. It is just expanding freely into vacuum. Hence, it is free expansion, no expansion work is done. As a consequence, our W is 0 and as a consequence, our delta E is 0. And Delta E can be written down as delta U plus delta E other. And since it is a gas and since it is, uh, we assume it to be stationary. So, 
we assume that delta E other is 0. So, this leaves us with delta U equal to 0 and since it is an ideal gas, U is a function only of T. So, if delta U is 0, delta T is 0 okay. and that means final temperature is the initial temperature and that means now we can proceed with the process diagram. The initial temperature will be T naught if this is the isotherm pertaining to T naught, the final state will be this. So, the final state is T naught temperature to V naught as volume and then use P V equals R T or P 1 V 1 by T 1 or P naught V naught by T naught is P 2 V 2 by T 2. Temperature is the same, volume doubles, so the pressure must become half. So, that also means that final pressure is initial pressure by 2. So, going back the pressure in the final state will have to be P naught by 2. The next part of the problem we have shown when equilibrium is re-established, that equilibrium is re-established means you have to wait long enough till it reaches equilibrium. That means, it reaches uniform values of pressure temperature. Of course, volume soon will become 2 V naught but it will take some time for the pressure to be uniformly uh, P naught by 2 and temperature to be uniformly settling again to T naught. Okay. Remember that this is totally a non quasi static process. So, you should not show it along an isotherm, you should just show it this is this dotted line is actually the isotherm, the actual process we can show only as a dotted line joining 1 by 2, 1 to 2. There is no meaning, no significance at all in the way this line is drawn. Just see to it that you do not mechanically or by default draw the isothermal line and that too as a continuous line. That is not the process which is executed. It is not a quasi static process. And since now we know the initial state and the final state, the entropy difference changes uh, depends only on that state, on the two states. So, calculate the entropy difference and uh, since, uh, well that is what you have to determine. That entropy difference will turn out to be I think P naught V naught into logarithm of or P naught V naught by T naught into logarithm of 2. I think I remember the solution. This will be a, a positive number. And the last question is which irreversible process has taken place? The answer is free expansion is an irreversible process. And for this free expansion to take place, you do not really have to make the partition valid, uh, re remove the partition suddenly. Even if you make a small hole in the partition, uh, that is sufficient. Maybe it will take more time to. Uh, uh, move from um, uh, the left chamber to right chamber, but eventually equilibrium will be established and the same uh, end state will be reached. Over. 1, 2, 2, 3 RBS engineering, Bichpuri, Uttar Pradesh, over to you. If we have two fluid, one is water at 100 degree centigrade and another is steam at 100 degree centigrade then what are the difference between entropy of both the fluids? I am assuming when you say water and 100 degree centigrade, you mean saturated liquid water at 100 degree centigrade. And when you say steam at 100 degree centigrade, I assume you are meaning, you mean the 
dry saturated steam at 100 degrees centigrade. Come to your steam tables, come to your steam tables, this data is found either on page 4 or in page 6. I am looking at page 6. Look at this 100 degrees centigrade line. Below that, I have blanked things out. So, the last line on this page as seen on this. 100 degrees centigrade saturation temperature. So, the system pressure will have to be 1.01325 bar. Come to the entropy column. The SF column says entropy of the saturated liquid is 1.307 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. That of the dry saturated vapor is in the last column 7.355 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. This is the answer you wanted. For liquid it is 1.307, for vapor it is 7.355. Over to you. So, there is one more question. Hmm? If we are having uh, two fluids, one is steam dry saturated steam and one is saturated water at the same temperature. Which one will have the higher internal energy? What we have uh, steam at, st you, you are comparing dry saturated steam and saturated liquid water, right? At the same temperature? Yeah, at the same temperature. You have the data here. For example, you look up the two columns under internal energy. I am again taking the example of 100 degrees C because I already have the data in front of me. And you will notice that the saturated liquid water has a internal energy of 418.9 kilojoule per kg and dry saturated vapor has an internal energy of 2506.5 kilojoule per kg. Yes, go ahead. Uh, there is another question, sir. Yes, madam. Uh, I want to know, sir, there is uh, any practical example of uh, conversion of uh, vapor into solid? Practical example of conversion of vapor into solid? Uh, difficult to find out because you will have to really go to uh, really cold places. But uh, since dry ice at uh, atmospheric pressure uh, uh, evaporates or sublimates directly into its vapor. That means, if you take carbon dioxide and start cooling it at atmospheric pressure, you will find that at sufficiently low temperature, it you will simply start getting flakes of solid, which will start falling down rather than droplets of liquids, which will start falling down or sticking to the surface of it. If you want, you can do that experiment. It is not very uncommon. There, there is a problem in sir numerical S12, SL12. Which exercise? SL12. You have water in a cylinder piston assembly as shown in the figure. There are two stops, a lower one at which the volume enclosed is 1 meter cube and the upper one at which the volume enclosed is 3 meter cube. The piston mass and the atmospheric pressure are such that the piston floats at 500 mega Pascal. The above described system, sorry 500 kilo Pascal, half a mega Pascal. The above described system has water initially at 1 mega Pascal and 500 degree C. This is allowed to cool to 100 degree C by rejecting heat to the atmosphere at 30 degrees C. Calculate the total entropy generated in the process. First, we have to appreciate the process itself. We are told that if the pressure of the system is 500 kilo Pascal, the weight of the piston and the atmospheric pressure is such that the piston will float on the fluid. And that means, if the pressure is higher than 500 kilo Pascal, the uh, pressure of the fluid will be large enough to start moving the piston upwards and then the piston will go to the upper stop and the volume enclosed will be 3 meter cube. If the system pressure falls below 
500 kilo Pascal, then the piston will start moving down and it will be stopped at the lower stops where the enclosed volume is 1 meter cube. Okay. So, the idea is if the pressure is higher than 500 kilo Pascal, the system will have a volume of 300 3 meter cube and any process will then be a constant volume process, so long as the pressure remains above 500 kilo Pascal. At 500 kilo Pascal, the piston will start floating and the volume will start reducing and but the volume cannot reduce below 1 kilo Pascal. If you try to volume cannot reduce below 1 meter cube because that is the limit and if you still try to reduce the volume, the volume will not reduce, but the pressure will reduce below 500 kilo Pascal. So, the possible process is like this. So, let us say this is P V and let us say this is 500 kilo Pascal that is 0.5 mega Pascal okay. and this is the volume 1 meter cube and this is the volume 3 meter cube. The volume of the system can never go below 1 meter cube, the volume of the system can never go above 5 meter cube. Okay. The initial state is 1 mega Pascal and 500 degree C. Since the pressure is higher than uh, 500 kilo Pascal, the piston will be at the upper stop and the volume will be 3 meter cube. Let us say this is 1 mega Pascal. So, the initial thing would be initial state, state 1 will be 1 mega Pascal, 3 meter cube and T 1 is 500 degree C. So, the state will be 500 degree C, V 1 is 3 meter cube and P is 1 mega Pascal. Okay. Now, with this P V T, we can determine all properties from the steam tables, because 500 degree C and 1 mega Pascal will uh, tell you 1 mega Pascal is 10 bar. So, 10 bar 500 degree C is definitely superheated. Look up the superheated steam tables, you will get specific volume. So, you will get mass and you will get all other properties. Okay. Now, what happens is it is allowed to cool to 100 degree C by rejecting heat to atmosphere at 30 degree C. So, our system which is this cylinder piston rejects heat to atmosphere which is another system like a reservoir at 30 degree C and as it uh, reduces now trace the process at some stage it will reach a pressure of 500 kilo Pascal. Okay. Hopefully, the process is not over till then. So, the first part of the process will be from state 1 to state A, where the volume will be 3 meter cube, but the pressure would reduce to 500 kilo Pascal. So, 3 meter cube, 500 kilo Pascal and we know the mass of the system now. We can determine what its temperature will be. If the process continues, it will now continue at constant pressure and uh, the next change will be at B. At B, it would have reached the lower stops, the volume would be 1 meter cube and further reduction in temperature would bring you to the final state 2. So, this is the estimated process. You can determine assuming these three processes to be quasi static processes and determine the net heat transfer out of the system when it is cooled. And when it is cooled, the net heat which comes out of the system will be absorbed by the reservoir and you can determine the change in entropy of the system and change in entropy of the reservoir. 
and hence the total entropy generated in the process. I hope this is understandable. Over to you. Yes. Sir, there is one more question. Sir, you, you told a free expansion is a reversible process. Why it is so? Free expansion is an irreversible process because you can't do anything by which the gas in one half after filled it will automatically go back and assume its old position of just half the uh, chamber. Nothing you can do. Once the gas expands and fills up the whole chamber, it will continue to occupy the whole chamber. What can you do without now remember there is no heat interaction, there is no work interaction. So, to reverse this, you, if at all it is reversible, that means you should not have any heat interaction, you should not have any work interaction, but even then you should do something, I do not know what, by which the gas in the half of this chamber, I think I have here, gas which occupies this right half of the chamber decides not to occupy it and go back to the left hand side and none of the molecules dare to come back on the right hand side again. That is just not possible and that is why it is called reverse, irreversible. And this is demonstrated because if you calculate the change in entropy of this adiabatic system, actually it is an isolated system more than adiabatic. So, for this isolated system the uh, entropy change turns out to be positive. So, even from the principles of thermodynamics, it is a uh, it is an irreversible process. Over. One more question. Yes. Sir, is there any natural process which can be considered as absolute reversible process? Is there any natural process which is considered as an absolute reversible process? No. I do not think there is any process in nature which is an absolutely reversible process. And that is why I have said in the beginning today that a reversible process is a thought process. It can be thought about, we can do lots of thinking about it, but we cannot execute it in practice, because no process in nature is a reversible process. Anything that happens in nature leaves its stamp somewhere. Sir, in problem SL5, SL the partition is suddenly removed. Why? The word suddenly is not needed, you can simply say the partition is removed or a hole is made in the partition, the problem does not change. Yeah. When the partition is suddenly removed, the process should not be uh, adiabatic process. Why? Adiabatic process is what you uh, do at the boundaries, if I insulate the boundaries perfectly, I can have an adiabatic process, what is wrong in it? But the boundaries are fixed and not heat is removed from the boundary. You can say that I just punched a hole in the boundary, small hole in the boundary which did not take much of an effort. So, I agree that suddenly is not a good word there, the partition is removed or in hole is made in the partition. Over. Last visit today, 1098 Marathwada Institute of Technology, Aurangabad. Over to you. Sir, uh, what is the significance of Helmholtz function and Kiss function in thermodynamics? Okay, these uh, Helmholtz function and Gibbs functions are derived for, they are mainly used in physical chemistry. We do not have much use of it in mechanical engineering unless you do uh, either combustion calculations or detailed calculations of the equations of state. And these are derived because they have to be found, they are found useful. As I said in that panel, I have already uh, put up all my today's morning slides on the net and on the Moodle. So, you will notice that uh, these are potentials. So, something like they indicate the capacity to extract work and we have shown that the Helmholtz function is a potential, the decrease in which represents the maximum work that can be extracted 
under isothermal conditions and Gibbs function is a potential the reduction in which represents the maximum work that you can do in an isothermal come isobaric process, uh, process which typically occurs during chemical reactions. Apart from this, uh, the Helmholtz function has the specific property because for that the natural variables are T and V unlike the other variables where you have a Gibbs function which has T and P. If you specify Helmholtz function as a function of T and V throughout that state space, then that has information from which you can extract critical point, you can extract all properties of state all over the state space. That is the advantage of the Helmholtz function. Over to you. Hello, Hello sir. One more question, sir. Yes. Uh, the transitional form of energy is said only heat and work for thermodynamics. Yes, energy transfer can take place only by two modes, one is the heat mode and one is the work mode. The electrical mode, electrical transitional form of energy it is? No, those are various types of work interactions. They are not different modes, electrical work, magnetic work, surface tension work, these are all work modes, they are not any distinct type of interactions. The interactions can be distinguished only as work type in which all these expansion, stirring, twisting, bending, electrical, magnetic is included and heat type. Heat is defined as the non-work type of interaction, that is it. Over to you. So, one, one, one more question. Yes. Uh, heat is equal to uh, change in enthalpy. Uh, enthalpy is property is H1 minus H2, uh, whereas Q is a path function, this uh, enthalpy is a, a point function. Your first statement that heat is the change in enthalpy itself is not right. Heat is an interaction, the only link between that and the rest of the world is it equals delta E plus W. Now depending on the process, it may turn out that delta E plus W is delta H. It will happen, I know under the following conditions. It will happen if the system is a closed system, the process is a quasi-static isobaric process and there is no work done other than expansion work. Then you will have Q equals delta H, but that is a derivation. And finally, depending on the process, the interactions will be related to properties of the initial state, properties of the final state and the details of the process. So that is what is happening. Finally, you will have Q equals something which will finally written in terms of properties of the initial state and final state. There is no contradiction here. That way even uh, isothermal work or any other type of work when you integrate that expression integral P dV to determine the expansion work, you will get in terms of the initial state and final state. So what is the problem? The problem is, the, the fact is given the same initial state and final stage, I can have different processes, so different expressions which represent work. The very first exercise in your exercise sheet exactly does that. I have one question. Yes. Uh, sir, as we have a specific heat at constant pressure, specific heat at constant volume, TP and TV. Is there any specific heat for uh, different processes like uh, isentropic processes? No, specific heat is defined as a change in some property like U or H uh, with respect to temperature at some other property being kept constant. So we define specific heats only two ways, Cv and Cp. There is no need or usually it is not defined it in any other way. For example, in principle if you want you can define du with partial of u with respect to T at constant pressure at some other type of specific heat, but that is not needed and that is usually not done. But you can evaluate du by dp at con, du by dt at constant T 
that can always be written down in terms of CP, CV and PVT data. The exercise sheet PR is all about that and you can create any number of exercises in the property relationship. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, stopping here today.